you to one last session this week. It's called Ohio and the Future of the Great Lakes Compact. Well, good morning. Is this uh, speaker working pretty good? I have a deeper voice, so I don't necessarily need to speak into the mic so much. Uh, good morning. So if you check your schedule, this is the Ohio and the Great Lakes Compact panel. Um, just want to make sure we're all in the same session that you want to be in the same session. Uh, my name is Mark Smith. I'm the Senior Policy Manager with the National Wildlife Federation out of our Great Lakes office in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, I work on a whole host of Great Lakes issues. Uh, most uh, importantly, the Great Lakes Compact and seeing the implementation through of the compact. But I also work on a lot of invasive species issues, Asian carp, ballast water, uh, and then throwing in when I have time, uh, nutrients and agriculture work. So, but for the most part today, obviously, we're here to talk about the Great Lakes Compact. And we have a really good panel. I'm really excited about it. I'm, I'm really honored to introduce the folks that we have on this panel. Um, but before we do that, I want to give you a quick snapshot of the Great Lakes Compact. And if you remember, um, you know, if you go back about 10 years plus years, there was, a, there was a threat to the Great Lakes for diversions. And when you say the word diversion, it doesn't matter who you talk to, people get that. Oh, we're taking my water from the Great Lakes and moving them to the southeast, no, not going to happen. So that was a real threat. And so that was kind of the spirit why all the Great Lakes governors, stakeholders in the, in the region, uh, came together to formulate an agreement that was signed into law by each state governor, governor and, and the President of the United States, and now we are operating under a new water management regime, which is really a, a, it's really a celebration. We need to celebrate this. It's, it's still an, an agreement that has precedent, um, international um, precedent. People look to the Great Lakes as, as a model for potentially managing water, and we need to remember that. Um, and, 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 in, and because it's such a model, a new model, a new way of thinking, it's complicated. And that's what we're going to kind of get at a little bit today and where we move ahead. And what we wanted to do today was basically talk about where we are in the implementation of the Great Lakes Compact. It was passed and signed into law in 2009. Uh, all the states, uh, except the, and the provinces, uh, Quebec, Ontario still has some issues they need to figure out. But for the most part, all the Great Lakes states have passed their legislation to implement the Great Lakes Compact, Ohio being the last one. We'll focus a little bit more on Ohio uh, throughout the panel. But what this means is that basically what's left is a couple rules packages to implement the, pa the, the, the compact. And this is so technical. I get lost in this stuff. I am not, I mean, I find myself rereading the compact, and I have an extra copy here. I reread the compact all the time to remember how complicated this thing is. So um, I hope our panelists will stay above the fray and not get into the technical weeds. I see Todd Ames. I'm sure he wants us to go to the technical weeds. But I'm sorry, Todd. We're not going to probably do that. Um, um, but. But the, the thing that they remember here is that uh, the states are doing what they're supposed to do. The compact is working. And so while people might have different interpretations of what the states are doing, whether they're doing exactly what the compact says or different what the compact says, that's, that's, that's a good discussion. And we're going to focus on Ohio as kind of a case study of what's happening with the compact. And so it's a good story. I mean, it's, it's, got all the, it's got all the drama. It's got all the, the things that really made the compact come together in the first place. Um, and we're going to talk about what, who worked together, the politicians, the stakeholders, um, and, and the media. The, the three worked together, uh, not always the, the, the right way, but they worked. And then the compact provided that framework. And so we're here to say that the compact is working. And so before we do that, <clears throat> I introduce the panelists. What's important to note here is that um, this is not about um, uh, looking at and, and bashing the state of Ohio. And so I want to get that across. This is about telling a story about Ohio and, and what we can learn from it. And while we might have differences on what happened in Ohio, we can all agree that uh, we all want to protect the resource. And we might have different interpretations of that, but we need to have this compact work. And the people in Ohio want this compact to work. So with that set up, uh, I, it's my pleasure to meet, uh, introduce our three panelists. Now, I'll, I'll introduce uh, their bios uh, all at once, then I'll, I'll call them up. First is uh, former Governor Bob Taft of Ohio. Um, he was, during the, his, his tenure in Ohio, he was the chair of the Council of Great Lakes Governors, which actually was the focal point for negotiating uh, the agreement, which became the compact. So he is the heart and soul of the negotiating of, of this compact, what we have here. So we had to thank him for that. He also is the current, yes, yes. 
I did not, I did not pay them to do that. That was all. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. And now he's the current lecturer at the University of Dayton. Um, so, um, and so I'll introduce him. Uh, he's our first panelist. Second panelist is Christy Meyer. She's the director of agriculture, clean water restoration. Pro it's a long title that goes on two business cards. Um, she's with the Ohio Environmental Council, and she's been instrumental in uh, serving on the Ohio Compact Advisory Council, which re provided recommendations to the legislature on uh, what we need to do for the compact in Ohio. And she's just a, a real, real firecracker, and, it, and she'll talk about what's happening uh, with the bill in Ohio and maybe what we can do next. And our third panelist is Christopher Evans with uh, editor chief, associate. associate editor with the editor Cleveland chief. editor chief. Okay, okay, uh -huh. chief editor. <laughs> okay, with the Cleveland Blaine dealer here in town. So, and he's going to talk a little bit about the role of the media in, uh, in, in telling a story in Ohio and what it, what it means for the, the compact. So, without further ado, that's my honor to introduce former Governor Bob Taft. Thanks, uh, Mark, and, and good morning. It's good to see all of you here. It's great to be back here in Cleveland. I want to thank. Uh, the conference for getting me out of uh, Dayton for a while. Uh, we live down there on the Little Miami River, which is a state scenic river, which of course goes the other direction into the Ohio. I also want to confess that I have a complete uh, conflict of interest here about uh, these uh, lakes because uh, every summer uh, my family and I go right about uh, here uh, to vacation. So uh, we vacation up on the St. Lawrence River, so, so we, we see the results of, the, of all uh, our efforts down here uh, every summer up there. Um, you know, looking back on it, when I ran for governor, obviously I wasn't thinking about uh, this kind of uh, an, an undertaking. Uh, we had a Clean Ohio initiative, which some of you remember, uh, but uh, then uh, Tom Ridge called me. He was outgoing uh, governor of Pennsylvania. Uh, he had been chair of the Great Lakes Council of Governors. Uh, and uh, in, asked me to consider taking that on, uh, which I did. Uh, and even to this day, I am completely amazed that eight states and two provinces were able to come together and negotiate this agreement to protect the waters of the lakes and the St. Lawrence River, and then have that compact ratified uh, by the Congress. Uh, it was a monumental undertaking. Uh, my, I, I thought when Governor Ridge called me that, you know, I might be, uh, you know, chair for a year, rotates, that kind of thing usually does. Well, one year became four years as chair because that's how long it took to negotiate the agreement. And then it took three more years for all the states and the provinces and the Congress to approve the agreement and then ratify the compact. In total, the working group, which we as governors and premiers appointed to, uh, to hash out this agreement, they met face to face for 90 different days over a period of four years, not to mention hundreds of telephone conference calls. During the process, governors came and went. Six Republicans and two Democrats at the beginning became two Republicans and six Democrats by the end. Political, partners, political partisanship was not a factor in the negotiations, which is truly re remarkable given how polarized uh, the political environment is today. Uh, I would like to especially thank and commend folks like uh, Christy here, and all of the advocacy groups, national, regional, state, and local, because they continued to press us on uh, to reach an agreement. They really kept the negotiators at the table through thick and thin. It was also, I think, pretty unique and pretty uh, amazing that the compact was approved so rapidly by the United States Congress in a presidential and a congressional election year. It almost flew under the radar, uh, in a sense. It, it was, it was, uh, I was surprised that it happened uh, as it did uh, and that other states didn't think about it, particularly given you know, the kind of crises that other states are facing uh, with regard to water. But as we all address the issue of implementation today, I think it's useful to reflect just for a moment on the purpose of the agreement in the first place. Uh, as Mark said, in the 1990s, the threat of water diversion from the Great Lakes uh, became very real, not just other states, but uh, the province of Ontario had granted a permit to a company in Sault Ste. Marie to ship water by tanker from Lake Superior to Asia. Uh, there was a public outcry. Uh, they rescinded that permit, but still, you know, that kind of got everybody's attention uh, very clearly. 
Uh, under the federal WR, the WERDA, Water Resource Development Act, any one governor could block a diversion, but our attorneys advised us that we really couldn't withstand a challenge to that law under international treaties uh, like uh, NAFTA, uh, World Trade Organization, because there was no decision-making standard for reviewing uh, permits, and also, for the most part, there were not strong efforts to conserve the use of water within each state. So we should all keep in our minds that the fundamental purpose of the compact is to ensure that decision-making and control over the waters of these Great Lakes remains within our region among the bordering states and provinces. This is a really, this is the critical point. This new authority that we gained came none too soon as water crises loom, crises loom across the country, as global warming makes itself felt, as new water uses arise, such as for shale oil drilling. As Mark said, we now have permitting laws enacted in all eight states, so the hard work is really just beginning. And all of those of us who are concerned about the lakes must be vigilant and actively engaged every step of the way. I want to stress the importance of cultivating governors, their cabinet members, and their staffs, since they're the ones who are doing the implementation. As you've heard, the legislature passed a bill last year in Ohio that would have been out of compliance with the compact had it not been for the intervention of a number of Lake Erie advocates, myself, former Governor Vornovich, and governors from other Great Lakes states, and the courage of Governor Kasich in vetoing the bill. It, that bill would have been enacted into law. We now have a better bill in Ohio, although one, as Christy will note, still leaves a lot to be desired. So our task now is to assure that the Ohio Department of Natural Resources uh, pursues very uh, strong rules and regulations and strong enforcement, and then work with legislators over time to improve the bill. Fortunately, Governor Kasich and his staff are now knowledgeable, but turnover is huge. Uh, when Governor Mitch Daniels completes his term in Indiana at the end of this year, none of the governors who signed the compact will still be in office. So it's so important for advocacy groups to educate new governors and their staffs and also uh, to create champions. One of the problems we had was the fact that we didn't have enough really strong champions in the Ohio State Legislature when the bill was going through. It was very difficult uh, to get the kind of bill that we really needed. So we all are in this together. This is an incredible asset that we have when you think about 90% of the surface fresh water uh, in the United States of America. This is more than just stewardship. This is more than just passing this on to the next generation. This is our comparative advantage. This is our competitive asset uh, for our economy and for our quality of life uh, for Ohio and all of the states and provinces that border on the Great Lakes. Thank you. Can you tell why you were so important to this? That was what you said. It was perfect. Thank you. Um, I was asked to talk about the importance of uh, coalitions. And I, I really love coalitions, quite frankly, um, because you unite voices. You're all speaking as one voice. It helps um, decision makers understand what is important. And you share resources, certainly something very vital. We all need additional resources. You bring additional expertise to the table if you bring in traditional and non-traditional folks that might be willing to work with you. And you provide different messengers. It's very important to know when you are not the appropriate messenger. I know that quite well. And that's why I draw on the expertise of the people that are in, within my coalitions. And you allow for different pressure points. So you have um, different messengers who can reach out to different folks who can then apply pressure on your target. And um, the coalition that we formed in Ohio around the Great Lakes Compact really consists of scientists, lawyers, environmental conservation organizations, small business owners, um, anglers, hunters, tourism groups. So it's really diverse and we're always trying to grow. Um, and let me give you a really good example of why I love coalitions. So it was the spring of 2011. I had literally just got back from maternity leave. 
I had a four-year-old son or four-month-old son at home, a three-year-old daughter, and a, um, a husband who was working full-time away from home. I have a full-time job, and all of a sudden I get a call from my public affairs director, Christy, get down here right away. What's going on, Jack? They're introducing the Great Lakes Compact, implementing legislation. Senator, Gren Senator Grendel and Representative Watchman had introduced their legislation, an industry-written proposal, and um, at the same time, we had been working on, our coalition had been working on a um, piece of legislation that was hopefully going to be introduced shortly. So it threw me into a whirlwind. Um, later found out that they had planned to pass that legislation out of um, the Ohio General Assembly within one month, and they were not joking around. It really made my head spin. So you can kind of see why, it's just starting off, I really like coalitions. Um, I would say that, uh, so right after I found out about the, the bill that they had introduced, I went back to my office, huddled in, and quickly read what was in that piece of legislation and put out my analysis in an, in an urgent email to all of my coalition members and said, this is my take on it, but what is your take as well? Am I missing something? And then I also put a lot of questions. Is this really important? Am I reading this wrong? I'm not the only, you know, I don't have all the answers. It's nice to have a scientist like Bob Heath or the small business owners like Kathy Hanratty you know, or Jared, who is a lawyer. So it's nice to be able to draw on those expertise, and certainly Mark has the regional perspective. Um, so once we all figured out exactly what this piece of legislation said, you know, we sat down with industry. We talked to them about our concerns. We tried to listen. We, we tried to hear um, some of their concerns and, and walk away with some sort of understanding that actually we weren't going to find any common ground, unfortunately. But um, one of the things that I thought was really useful is it brought our coalition together. We all got on the same page. We formed our um, talking points, and we formed a press statement. We were consistently talking the whole time about, um, you know, we, uh, about what is this legislation, what is this move, how do we move forward. We started forming um, regular calls, again, we would have uh, monthly calls and sometimes more regular, to strategize around our next moves and divvying up tasks, which is certainly important um, because sometimes uh, I'm just not the right person to do that job or somebody else. So once, when we took a look at, I guess what, so moving back, when we took a, lot, a look at um, all of the work that was on the table, we would divvy it up according to who is the right messenger and who has the best relationship and who has the best skill to do that work. Because we don't want to waste our resources. We don't want to spin our, you know, our wheels just not going anywhere. Um, and so as a result of, of really coming together and figuring out, you know, who, I'm, did I advance? I'm sorry. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Here, I'll move back. Oh, it's, it's now advancing. I'm sorry. So um, as a result of, of this coalition coming together, divvying up tasks, you know, constantly reporting back, um, we were able to secure media around Ohio, the Great Lakes region, and D.C., highlighting Ohio as the weakest link in the compact. <laughs> And I really could not keep up with how much media we actually gained. But we, we did gain over 100 articles in newspapers, over 20 TV hits, four radio interviews, including NPR, three opinion editorials, five letters to the editor from our stellar volunteer, Kathy Hanratty, over 20 editorials, some of which actually published phone numbers of the governor's office so that the readers could call and strongly urge the governor to veto that bill. Also, many of these editorials were read on the House and Senate floor as to why we should not be, uh, as why as the legislators should not be voting for that legislation. We had letters from the anglers and hunters expressing their concerns, which held more weight with the majority in the General Assembly than really, you know, an environmental group. So again, know your messenger. We had opponent letters from former U.S. Senator George Voinovich, who carried the legislation on the Senate floor. Former IJC Commissioner, Ohio Department of Natural Resources Director, Sam Speck, who was the one that spent many, many, many hours on um, bringing everyone together under the direction of Governor Taft's 
um, administration, as well as former ODNR directors Joe Summer, Fran Buckholzer, Ohio EPA director Chris Jones. We had letters from Ohio U.S. Representatives Betty Sutton, who carried the legislation on the House floor, Tim Ryan and Marcia Fudge, U.S. House of Representative Great Lakes Task Force co-chairs, and numerous letters from environmental conservation groups from around the, the whole Great Lakes region, including Canada, numerous of people calling the governor's office at the last minute. And I'd really say there was two big events that took our, our um, campaign to the next level. One of them was being able to reach out to Governor Taft. I mean, as he said, this is, you know, this is a resource that is um, very important and very important personally to him and to uh, express to him what was going on. And it was, um, I remember, late on a Friday night and finally got a hold of his, a board member of ours and former chief of staff. Do I need to do this now? Yes, yes, you do need to do this now. I need you to get a hold of Governor Taft. He came down and testified in opposition of this bill, and it really sent us into um, the next level. And then informing and, and working with coalition members to inform uh, governors um, from New York and from Michigan about how this would impact them in their states as well, and Lake Erie. And so, uh, you know, Governor Como, as a result, said that he would sue. And I know that um, Governor, Mich uh, Mich Governor Snyder's office did have conversations with Governor Kasich's office. It is a better bill, but it still um, falls short of in line with what other states are doing. But nonetheless, the legislation um, became effective September 4th, and so rules will be out in March 4th. And um, really, we are really focused now on how do we make those rules as strong as possible. And so that is really where we would draw on many of you. And again, we're drawing on our coalition and being proactive. So Kristen Kubica, who's in the back here, um, that works with Ohio Environmental Council, has been pulling together this coalition, and we're proactively putting together recommendations for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources so that we can sit down with them yet this month, hopefully, and start talking about some of those recommendations and then continue to work on those recommendations and continue to have those discussions. Certainly, always reaching out to the industry and finding out what their concerns are as well. And I think it's really important to be able to come together with the opposition and sit down and to find out where there is some compromise. So I'm getting the one minute mark and I think I'll, I'll wrap up then. But that, that is really why I think uh, coalitions are important. And um, I would urge you to consider you know, drawing on expertise in, the, in your coalitions or partnering up with other folks that can bring different and, and additional resources but different expertise to the table. Thanks, Christy. As you, uh, as you can tell, I have a, a, I'm using an old PowerPoint, but I just wanted this slide, so that's okay. And if you want, we can do this one, too, if you want, as well. Um, next is Christopher Evans. Uh, he's with the Plain Dealer, and he's going to talk about what the media's role is uh, in Ohio in relation to Thank you. Um, well, I think the media plays, obviously, a, a big role. Um, I think that we bring a large and diverse audience to the issues. I mean, we raise awareness. I like to think we enhance credibility. Um, and we can do things that um, advocacy groups and other groups can't do. We don't have political agendas. Um, we like to ask hard questions, and we get snippy if we don't like the answers. Um, but we can't do that without informed sources. And that's where coalitions are important. For that, I mean, I rely on advocacy groups such as the Healing Our Waters Great Lakes Coalition. Um, my favorite Great Lake guru, Dr. Jeff Reuter, and environmental extremists like Christy. Um, uh, I, I really, until uh, I started working with Christy, had no sense of how we could help uh, protect Lake Erie. Um, and it was, it was sometime when Christy returned from her maternity leave uh, that we were talking, and um, she was explaining this bill that Grendel and Watchman had introduced. And I, I wrote my first editorial on June 12, 2011. I, 
my reaction to the bill, and I did not get into the technical details uh, because they just, that's why I talked to Christy actually. Um, but just the fact that the two sponsors were so reprehensible. I mean, <laughs> Grant, whatever was in the bill, um, you, you, one of the sponsors, Tim Grendel, as the governor can attest, uh, worked tirelessly to kill the compact. Uh, and his partner, uh, the always reprehensible Lynn Watchman, um, owned a water bottling company and um, also sat on the board of the International Bottled Water Association. So, I mean, there was a clear conflict of interest. Whatever was in the bill, it stunk. Um, but what this industry-driven water withdrawal bill would do is it would turn Lake Erie, a public resource, into a private asset. It contained blatant violations of the spirit, if not the letter, of the compact. Um, and so I was interested uh, in doing everything I could to derail it. Um, and so uh, I began writing regular editorials. I would include phone numbers and encourage people to call their elected representatives. We named the Republicans and Democrats who supported the bill. And along the way, we picked up uh, steam. I mean, Toledo Blade started to weigh in more regularly. Even the Columbus Dispatch removed its lips from the governor's posterior long enough to criticize the bill. And other states uh, or other papers, you know, really joined the battle. And um, to me, it was really kind of depressing because I just watched that license to plunder just swim through the House and the Senate. It was like they weren't, read they weren't listening. They, nobody cared. Um, I wrote a final edit on July 11th, 2011, where, which basically was kill the bill, kill it. And uh, I directed it to Governor Kasich and I included his phone number. The public response was immediate and overwhelming. Within half an hour, there had been so many calls to that number, no one could get through. And so they posted that on, online in the comments. And I called my good friend Rob Nichols and said, you know, we need another number. And he said, no, we're not going to do another number. So I said, well, I'll just use your cell phone number then. <laughs> and and we, we got another number and, and people blew that number up. And on Friday, July 15th, I remember this because I wrote three editorials that day. The first editorial was just ripping Kasich for signing the bill. And then I got a call from Rob Nichols and he was saying, well, actually the governor's going to take the weekend to think about it. So I wrote a second editorial saying, you know, this speaks to, to his due diligence and hopefully he'll do the right thing. He's paying attention. And then Rob called me and he said, you know what, he's killing the bill. So, of course, the first person I called was Christy, who didn't believe me. <laughs> um, she thought that I was just kind of screwing around. And I'm like, no, I, seriously, he's going he's gonna to kill the bill. And Christy, being Christy, of course, cried. Um, <laughs> and what I, like to, what I like to think is that Watchman and Grendel were crying, too. 